the season ended today, the Falcons and Colts would be in the postseason. But both have lost three of their last four and are desperate for a win. The Falcons and Colts coverage begins Sunday at noon Eastern on ESPN Radio. The topics are hot. The discussion is heated. And we're on fire. The First Take Podcast starts now. Here's what's coming up on the First Take Podcast. Why is LeBron questioning his team's hunger? Plus, do white receivers lack attention in the NFL? And are the Broncos really hoping Peyton will stay on the bench? That and so much more coming up on the podcast. Welcome into a hump day edition of First Take. Thank you so much for hanging with us. The whole crew is in the house. Skip Bayless, Stephen A. Smith. Told y'all I'd be I'm back. Kim. You What's did. up, big boy? How are you? How are you doing? Morning, guys. Hey, hey, hey. How are you doing? On? I'm good. All right. Mike Greenberg just walked by and told me to tell you that he softened you up on Mike and Mike for me. Is that true? I don't believe it. Like body blows, little little rabbit punches to You know, I wouldn't say that. You know, they try to because yeah. I think you quietly got fans around to be trying to look out for you because they tired of the beat downs you usually get. Oh. You know, but I don't let it I, I give them the impression that they may have softened me up, mm. but it never works. Okay. Yeah. Such like a, a box square. To, uh, you're listening to a brother. I'm so <laughs> impressed. Uh, I'm is, listening to a sister. Is, <laughs> I'm listening to a sister. Oh, right. I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got That's you. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Fair All enough. Right. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Let's work. All right. Let's, let's go. Talk about Skip's Cowboys and how they always find a way to stay relevant. And in case you missed it, I must admit this was pretty good. Tony Romo tweeting a clip from Major League. Guess there's only one thing left to do. When the whole effing thing. Skip scale of one to ten. How much did you like this tweet? Wait, well, you didn't really give the whole thing, right? Okay. Uh, like, well, there's right? more? There's well, more you well, want to give? Well, I'll get to it okay. in just a second. So let's get back to your question. Okay. Scale of 1 to 10. Let me think. Mm -hmm. Scale of 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. I love this. A 20. How about a 20, Stephen A. Smith? Mm -hmm. I love, love, loved this. This was the highlight of my day yesterday. And I even got to see you in the afternoon as we did a photo shoot together yes. with Molly. Yes. And, and yet this was the highlight of my day because this was audacious. This was gutsy. This sent a powerful message to a football team in dire need of a powerful message from its <laughs> leader. As Tom Berenger said in the iconic movie, Major League, which is the classic worst to first movie, right? right? Tom Berenger in the clubhouse looks at his teammates and says, there's only thing, one thing left to do. Win the whole bleeping thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can't see that because we can't show it. and It would be more powerful. And if you saw the tweet from Romo, you can see great. the clip. Mm -hmm. And... I want to explain to you, Mr. Smith, mm -hmm. some quarterbacks, maybe most franchise quarterbacks, would be a little leery of returning from injury to a team that has lost seven straight games. Mm -hmm. And most quarterbacks would think, now, wait a second. Mm -hmm. They're expecting me to be the savior of this mess, not Tony Romo. Remember what he did after the Patriots lost at Jerry World this year when he was injured, obviously? Remember when he marched right up to Tom Brady after the game? Popped him on the shoulder I have, pad. I have no recollection. Remember that, of that. one? I and he said, "See you in February." I have no recollection of that because I think that Tony Romo was on the sidelines. He wasn't playing, which makes him irrelevant. But that's oh, just me. Okay. But go ahead. When he did that to Tom Brady, I thought the audacity, to quote Stephen A. Smith, the temerity, the unmitigated gall. And I love that one because Tony Romo believes that this division is shockingly winnable. So now he tweets out this link mm -hmm. to Major League, and he is embracing, he is owning the pressure to be the savior of this team mm -hmm. in this division. Mm -hmm. Even from a last place two and seven, mm -hmm. I'm sure Tony Romo sits back and says, hmm, mm -hmm. Mark Sanchez is now the quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles? And I'm sure Tony Romo is thinking, hmm, Kirk Cousins hasn't yet won an away game this year, a road game? And he might even be thinking, hmm, Eli Manning has led this league in interceptions three different times in the last three years in a row. Eli's team has not made the playoffs. Am I right about that? You're right. Miss Connecticut, Miss right. Giants fan? You're right. right. Okay. So Tony Romo sits back and says, hmm, this is doable. I've been telling you both. 
from day one, I've had this feeling about this team. It is eminently doable. It obviously has to start in Miami this Sunday. The odds makers say this is an even Steven game. This is a picket game. Cowboys at Dolphins. I will be the first to sit right here in this chair on Monday morning if they blow this game with Tony Romo at quarterback and say, I was wrong. You got me. But I think I'm going to be right at least about this Sunday, and then we'll see what happens from week to week because I got Tony Romo back, and nobody else does. Well, it's very, very touching that you feel this way. Quite hilarious, mm -hmm. I might add. Um, the fact of the matter is the Dallas Cowboys haven't won a game since September 20th. Mm -hmm. It will have been two months since they've mm -hmm. won a game, assuming they win this weekend in Miami, which is no gimme. Mm -hmm. We also have to combine uh, you know, th th those things by saying, you know, it's really, really interesting and quite pathetic mm. that the Dallas Cowboys find themselves mm. in this situation. Seven games without Tony Romo, and you couldn't manage to win one game. There's so many flaws with this organization, from, the, from Jerry Jones on down, and it's basically been exposed. I love how you sit up here and you love this tweet. Guess what? And you think it's such a big deal. If you're Tony Romo, why shouldn't you be confident? You're playing with house money. You know why? Oh, really? Because they haven't won a game without you. The greatest thing, let me tell you one, let me tell you the only bad thing about these Dallas Cowboys having lost seven straight. That Tony Romo's contract negotiation should have been now instead of him re you know, re up and over a year ago. He you got know his why? money. He's okay. He, he, he are, he, oh, yeah, we yeah, know he's yeah. all right. 108 yeah. million, 55 million mm -hmm. guaranteed. Yeah. But here's the deal. What I laugh about is the fact that if Tony Romo were negotiating his deal right now, Jerry Jones might have had to give him about $150 million. Why? Because they are zero without him, mm -hmm. winless without him. It doesn't matter Keep that going. you have Darren McFadden. It doesn't have matter okay. that you have Des Bryant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that you have that massive offensive line. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that you went out and got Greg Hardy, that Rolando McClain came mm -hmm. back, okay? You know, it doesn't matter. None, none, none of that matters. Even Sean Lee came back with Zidja before he got mm -hmm. concussed. You got all of that stuff going on. Here's the reality. If you're Tony Romo, there's absolutely no pressure because guess what? They were winless without you. Anywhere you go is up. Certainly he's not going to win every game in my estimation, but even if he went, mm -hmm. it, it skip, even if he ended up going four and three yep. over the final seven games, mm -hmm. it's still better than 0 and 7. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, is that he has nowhere to go but up because he's playing with house money, yep. which, by the way, let me say for the record, I find to be utterly disgusting mm -hmm. because the fact of the matter is Tony Romo's career playoff record is two and four. Tony Romo has never even played in an NFC championship game. Damn near, d d d certainly has not taken anybody to a Super Bowl. But we talk about him like he's the second coming. The second coming of what? Captain of mediocrity? That's what we need to call him because that's what the Dallas Cowboys have been. And it's chickens coming home to roost. You let go of DeMarco Murray after running him into the ground. You thought you could bring anybody back to sit up there and run the football. But Skip Bayless, you were thinking about yardage. You were thinking about talent. You were thinking about effectiveness. What you weren't thinking about is workload. Mm. Who could you give the ball to 392 times? Who could you allow to have 449 touches? Who could you allow to spell and relieve t Tony Romo and safeguard him by taking the workload off of his shoulders? You had nobody to do that, which is why he probably got hurt in the second game against Hicks to begin with. In the end, what it comes down to is very, very simple. Mm -hmm. The Dallas Cowboys aren't going to the playoffs this year. Mm. The Dallas Cowboys are pretty much finished. Mm. The Dallas well, Cowboys. out on a limb at 2-7. and seven. Well, I'm not going out on a limb. Yeah. That's my whole point. Yeah. I'm just trying to reel you back into reality because you're trying to find an excuse mm -hmm. to cheer and praise and be hopeful. There is no hope. Let me be the first person to break your heart. Let me be the first person to ruin mm. your season. Mm. Your Dallas Cowboys are going down. Mm. They're already down, actually. It's just not official yet. Mm. It's over. So you go ahead and you pray for little Tony Romo, okay? Mm -hmm. And have him sit up there and remind us of lines from the Major Leagues, the mm -hmm. movie, okay? Leave. Even Major Singular. League. <laughs> you're right, you're right, because I was thinking, I just say Major Leagues, but I like the one with Tom Hanks as opposed oh. to the second one for me personally. You did? Yes, I did. Yeah, there's oh. no crying in baseball. Oh, oh, it's like there's no crying in football. Okay. You, that's the league of the yeah, own. The but the point that I'm yeah. trying to make to you is, in the end, what it comes down to, Skip, it, yes. is this. Your guy is absolutely positively important to the Cowboys. But the Cowboys 
are not important to the rest of us. Mm. They're irrelevant. Mm. We'll watch them. They'll probably beat Miami, then go lose to Carolina for all mm. we know. It'll be something along those lines, mm. but it's pretty much a done deal. Mm. So my excuses, as I correctly pointed out to you, are not about my Cowboys. Mm -hmm. They're about Kirk Cousins and Mark Sanchez and maybe even your guy, Eli. Those are my excuses. Yeah, but, because you, still, but you still have to play is, the Jets, Buffalo, all, and Carolina. That's and fine. Bay. This is all by default because even you admitted to me, if Romo and Dez had been healthy all the way through, this team would be leading yes, the NFC East, I totally right? Agree. I totally agree. Okay? So that's what Tony Romo thinks. Tony Romo, by far, led this league in QBR last year. By far. He, he, he like, lapped the field in okay. QBR last year. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept that he's having the guts to basically make a prediction. Let's just, we got one thing left to do here. We're going to go win the whole effing I, I thing. I did like the trade. Really? That's pretty I, I, strong. Listen, listen. I'm trying to figure out what year has that not been the cause. I mean, isn't that the cause every year? Isn't that a tweet that you could, how come he didn't send that out before week one? How come he didn't send it out last year when there were expectations? Why does he pick now? Because he's got the security wait, 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 blanket. Wait, wait. He, they're, they're in last place. But that's so what I'm he's saying. doing major league. What I'm saying like he, to you is, what I'm saying to you is he's doing it now. This isn't the first time they've been in last place in the Tony Romo era. Okay, so let's be clear about but he that. He hasn't done this before. But this is the first he hasn't time he's done this. Tom Brady well, on the pads and said, I'll see you in he February. Hasn't been in a situation. It. Like he hasn't been in a situation where they were 0-7 without him. He's playing with house money because they stunk up the joint, the NFL specifically, without him. Blowing leads in five different games. They stunk up the joint. So you have nothing to lose. And that's what's going on. On here, so just accept it. Uh, listen, I, uh, listen. This is what this subject's about here. Mm -hmm. Don't fool the American public. This is what this subject's about. You're depressed, and I'm what you're depressed. Here you are. Yes, you are. You're trying to. I'm hide. excited. You're looking for an excuse to be excited. I don't need you got excuses. one. You got one little thread of hope holding on to. You're uh -huh. hold, You're literally holding on. You know, by a thread. This is where you are, and you're trying to prevent yourself from falling into that, into that abyss. Seed. That's what it is. Skip Bayless, I will not help you this time. Okay. I'm going to help you with the truth. I will not pull you up from the abyss, Skip. But I'm going to let you plummet. You're I'm going to let you my fall. Point. It's over. Everybody in the division is holding on by a thread. So are my Cowboys, but so are your Giants, and so are those Eagles, and so are those Redskins. Those Giants are by a thread. Oh, it's a fair what, Miss Connecticut? It is fair. It's fair. That that we very don't fair. Know how the Five losses of I don't think the Cowboys, but I'm just saying. All I'm saying to you is this: really has a shot if the point. Giants, the Giants have how many games left? Six. The Giants could go two and four. I mean, not two and four, but they can go. What is it? Three so and five three. And five. They yeah. can go three and three. Mm -hmm. You can win that division with an eight and eight record. That would still require the Cowboys to win six or seven games, mm -hmm. I'm telling you they ain't winning six or seven games. How do you know that? Because they're the, they're, the they're the Cowboys. They're the Cowboys. They're the Cowboys. They'll find a way to mess it up. I keep trying to tell you that. I keep trying to tell you. I said something will happen. That's all I ever say to you. I never say specifically what because we don't know. Dallas is Hollywood, man. They invent new ways to lose. They invent new ways to struggle. As long as they keep in the headlines, they don't lose that intensity like Michael Irvin said. Please keep the intensity. Don't lose the intensity. Please keep the intensity. That's what the Dallas Cowboys do. They always get get the headlines. But what they don't do is get results. This is who they are. Here's who when this team is. When are you going is. to accept it? Seven straight losses, and in six of the games, they were right there to win mm. the game at the end of the game. Am I right about that? They should have won, could have won yeah. six out of the seven. Sure. Not the Brady the game at home. Sure. Okay? Sure. All right. So Tony Romo's looking at, I got a good football team here. If I can get Dez cranked back up, maybe restores confidence because I'm back. Right. I'm throwing him the football now. All of a sudden, the Cowboys might morph right back into yeah. the Cowboys that we all thought had a real shot at getting to the Super Bowl, not just winning the division. Right. I will right openly about confess to you. I would be very miserable if the Cowboys came back from this. Mm -hmm. But I, but that's only because I don't see it happening. I mean, please, listen, man, just accept it. And, and, and listen, if they have to play within the division and all their remaining games within the NFC East, I'd give you a legit shot. Mm -hmm. But when I think about those games outside the divisions, against Green Bay, against mm -hmm. Carolina, against the Jets, against the Buffalo Bills, against Miami, I'm thinking uh, at least three of those five games are in all probability a loss. I don't love any of those teams you just mentioned. I don't love any of them. Well, I understand that, and I don't love the Cowboys. Okay. So we're Good. either. Good. I need to be clear on one thing, though. So if they lose to Miami, then it's officially sure. over? Oh, that's it. Over. Okay. Well.
you know, they'll probably be Hope. Miami this weekend. Now. Oh, probably. We'll You're see. scared. No, no, no. Sunday I think they'll at lose one. Carolina. They'll lose to Carolina. I'll be paying oh, attention to Miami. that more intensely. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave you with this. According to Elias, no team has ever made the postseason after being two and seven or worse oh, oh, hey. through nine oh, games. Hey. Backs right. against the wall. History right. is about to be made by Tony oh, Romo. Dallas Cowboys will make history. I guess there's only one thing left Please. to do. Speaking of making history, LeBron James has done that, but he is very frustrated right now after the Cavs' second straight loss on the road, losing to the Bucks in OT Saturday and to the Pistons last night. Shout out to Andre Drummond, by the way. From where? UConn. Ballin. The defeat, exactly, brought Cleveland's record to 8-3, and three, still good enough for the top spot in the East, but also not at the same level as the 12-0 Warriors. Here's LeBron after the game. We haven't done anything. We didn't win anything. We lost. We lost in the finals, you know, so that's enough motivation for myself. And I think uh, we need to understand that, like, we lost in the finals. We didn't win, you know, and the team that beat us is looks more hungry than we are, you know, so um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. The Cavs are not as hungry as the defending champs. Stephen A., do you like that LeBron voiced that? Absolutely. First of all, he has the authority, the cachet, the credentials, uh, the knowledge. Um, he puts in the work. He's a superstar in this league. He's religiously either the top or one of the top two players in the world, and he's a two-time champion. He has earned the right to say that. More importantly, he's absolutely 1,000% correct. But it's a product of what you have available to you. Um, Kevin, Kevin Love, I don't care how decent he's looked, skipping averaging 17 mm -hmm. points a game this year. He's shooting what from the field? 40% from the field? I mean, he's got to do better than that. You got J.R. Smith. He's up and down. We all know that. Mo Williams has been an asset to this franchise. Tristan Thompson missing training camp had something to do with the level of cohesiveness that they're still trying to capture. And again, you have to look at it from the perspective that the Eastern Conference is not as challenging as the West, and they know it. And so taking all of those things into consideration, along with the fact that it's an 82-game marathon, there are guys that simply don't put in the work that LeBron James puts in, so he has the right to say that. If you talk to people who know LeBron, if you talk to LeBron from time to time, Skip, his home is like, I mean, it, 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 the gym is like the gym at an arena. You know, everything that he could possibly need, he has. This dude is consistently and religiously working out to keep himself in peak condition and to be about the business of being able to go for it. And what he's basically saying is that other guys need to step up. He had 30 last night. You know, Kevin Love had his 19. J.R. Smith and Mo Williams had their 15 points. But he can tell. He's been around long enough to be able to tell when there's a level of urgency. And in fairness, and the other big point I'd like to make, Skip, is this. When Cleveland lost the finals, they had the excuse that Kevin Love was out and Kyrie Irving was not healthy. So it's not just the public who believes they would have won the chip. It's the Cavaliers. LeBron has been around long enough to know not to take that for granted. The rest of them don't. The flip side is Golden State, as champions, have been fending off skepticism about their fraudulency or their legitimacy since they won the title. Which is why Steph Curry and those boys have a chip on their shoulders and mm -hmm. they're playing like it. And go, and the Cleveland Cavaliers are the ones trying to walk around like they won something mm -hmm. and they did not. So for LeBron to point that out, I think that's a beautiful thing because it highlights what mm. he's seeing from his teammates. And mm. we know he doesn't see it that way because he can't afford to see it that way because champion or not, no champion, everybody's coming at him. Mm. every night mm -hmm. they're not coming at the rest of the players like that mm -hmm. I did not think the timing of this was a beautiful thing I was surprised LeBron picked this spot to, to, to take that shot at his teammates because he did not include himself in the blast he was pointing fingers at the rest of his teammates without naming names I assume Kevin Love was maybe at the top of the list I'm gonna say this again Kevin Love is not capable of living up to what LeBron expects of him. He is what he is. They overpaid him. I told you, I've been on record. I'm not being a hypocrite about this. 
he is what he is not in the end. He's not that guy. He's not a fourth quarter guy. And if you're going to lean he's on him. He's not a hundred million dollars. He's guy. not a guy. Come on. So you can't expect that from him. Now, to be fair, there's no Kyrie right now, and there's no Shumpert. And those are two huge key pieces to this, this puzzle, Starting right? Backward. Okay, it is. So so let's let's keep it in some perspective. But I was surprised LeBron picked this spot because LeBron wasn't great in the fourth quarter last night. I told you the last game we talked about, he was great in the fourth quarter. He chose last night to play all 12 minutes, which is unusual, wouldn't you say? Yes. All 12 minutes of the fourth quarter. He played 40 for the game, and didn't we hear before the season, I want to go with the Pop model, the Popovich model, right? I want to keep my, my minutes to maybe 30-ish or so, like the Spurs do. So he plays 40 minutes. He plays the whole fourth quarter. And he scores five points in the fourth quarter, including one completely uncontested layup with 16 seconds left. So really just three other points besides that. He missed another key free throw. He's shooting 62% from the free throw line. That's pathetic. i got to tell you, so you got to point a finger at yourself so far. I know it's early, but 62% from the free throw line. And for that matter, he's not a three-point shooter. We know that. But 31% from three is hurting his team. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. 33 free throws he's missed already this year. So I'm looking at his fourth quarter. He had two late turnovers. That, it looked like the game was about to slip away anyway, but he had two chances late, and their double team, and I get that one, was on an inbounds pass very late. But, but he turned the ball over, so he didn't have a good fourth quarter. Big deal. But why would you then pick that moment after that game to say, we're not hungry enough. We don't want it as much as Golden State does. Well, we often see that the loser of a finals or the loser of a Super Bowl, as we're seeing with Seattle, they, you, you have a hard time. You have a hard time dredging it back up because you were so close. Then they got bad breaks. They lost players. So I, I don't really get the motivational blast at this point because I'm not sure it's fair right now to the, the remaining team. Well, that depends on how you look at it. You might have a point if you're just looking at it on its face. If you're delving deeper and you surmise that what he's seeing from the rest of his teammates is an absence of urgency, thereby putting a heavier load on him than he wants to carry, Maybe. then that's a different argument. Because, again, if you're going to point to the 12 minutes that he played and a lack of productivity because they were minus 11 with him on the with floor on in the, the fourth floor. quarter, yep. okay, if you're going to point to the fact that he played those 12 minutes and you're going to point to the performance, why not also take a moment to point to why he may have felt the need to play those 12 minutes? in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Could it have been because he's looking at his troops and he's not seeing them address the challenge with the level of urgency that it deserves. Now, we know that Stan Van Gundy is coaching these Pistons. He's also the president of basketball operations. They elected to, they elected to lose out on Greg Monroe, mm -hmm. let him go to Milwaukee. Uh, they kept Andre Drummond, who is flat out balling. Is. I mean, this dude so, can walk yeah. up hey, a double. Reggie He's, Jackson can play, too. And He's Reggie Jackson explosive. can play. Reggie double Jackson double can play. Game this season. That's right. Those two, I like. I like those two in Detroit. I think it's some of the better talent they've mm -hmm. had in the last few Agreed. years. I got a lot of respect for what I see them trying to do. But the flip side to it is that they're going to come at you and if you're LeBron, you're going to look around at guys and say, how are you responding to this challenge? And why do I feel, you know, you might have elected to go there in the fourth quarter, but then you're going to turn around after that game is over and you're going to say to yourself, why the hell did I feel the need to have to be in this game in the fourth quarter against the Detroit Pistons. Mm -hmm. If it were the San Antonio Spurs or Oklahoma City mm -hmm. Thunder or Golden State Warriors or even the Clippers, fine. But the Detroit Pistons, I need to come and play the entire fourth quarter for us to have a chance to win this okay, game. I'm going to point it this out. Quick point of order. It's gonna make Remember, you look at people. earlier in the fourth quarter, all the way to the 843 mark, yep. LeBron had a 10-point lead in this game at Detroit. That's right. So even with him on the floor, given whatever he had left to give, yep. all 12 minutes, they could not close that they deal. They could not close that deal. Okay. So he's culpable. He, he is right. culpable. And, and when you say he has the authority, the cachet, he, he didn't have it off last night's fourth quarter. That's why I was surprised at the... At the, the opportunity mm -hmm. that he chose mm -hmm. to, to make that statement when it tells me back. and I'm saying to you it tells me he's seeing something we may not be seeing maybe from his teammates well I think it's aimed mostly at Kevin Love that's what I think but I don't hasn't, know. hasn't Kevin Love been the thorn in LeBron's side since last year well hasn't he, he continues to look for something in Kevin Love I think it's, it's I, not there I think it's fair to I think it's fair to say that because you gave Kevin Love a hundred million dollars yeah. these guys know how to count and at the end of the day, if you're getting paid that money, 
I need more from you than yep. 17 points or 19 I agree. points. I need more than an average performance from you. I actually need you to do something to the point where I don't need to do much because you got this from time mm -hmm. to time, so I don't have to take it. Okay, and last quick point about Golden State, which LeBron does not point out. Golden State got a great break during this offseason. They had a media-made chip placed on their shoulder because nobody gave them much respect. It was lucky that they got through, yep. and I was right there with them. I think there was a lot of luck involved in their championship run last year. Then nobody gave Steph any real recognition as an MVP candidate, including us. And all of a sudden, they were able to go into game one saying, quiet really? watch everyone. this. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. I just, you know, listen, Golden State is at a decided advantage in that regard. And even though we're sitting here talking about luck, I'm not so sure it's about luck. It's got to be something more than that. I don't know because I've been too busy doing other things and I haven't. You? I have I know. I got, so I have not taken the time to call, even though I just left Cleveland. That was on personal business. Mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't been to the Cleveland Cavaliers in, in, in more than a week or so, you know, digging my nose into what's going on. But I don't think it's just about love. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, e even with Kyrie not there, I think some stuff is weighing on LeBron. I think that he's seeing that the organization, you know, he might be thinking the organization could do things a little bit differently. That Kyrie, he's worried about Kyrie. He's looking at a guy like Jr. questioning your level Maybe. of discipline. I would agree. Uh, you know, uh, all of that stuff is going on. It could be anything right now. I simply don't know, but I don't think it's just love. Jordy Nelson is one of the best route runners, very, very explosive, a deep threat, can run any route in the route tree, and is a great um, with the ball in his hands after the catch. Now, Edelman is a tremendous slot receiver, has great short area quickness, has understanding to be able to read the defense, and has great chemistry with Tom Brady. I believe he's just as good as Troy Brown was, but people give credit for Troy Brown for being good. And I think Wes Welker and Edelman and some other guys, they don't get credit because they're white. That was Hall of Fame wide receiver Chris Carter on Mike and Mike this morning. He certainly knows a thing or two about the position, essentially saying white receivers get no love. Stephen A., do you like that CC said this? Well, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, I don't dislike it. Let me be very clear. Um, I think to some degree he's right. I just think that, you know, a lot of times we have to analyze why that is. In the case of Jordy Nelson, I think it's inexcusable because – as great as Aaron Rodgers is, Jordy Nelson being that deep threat that he was and being able to do the kind of things, you know, that, that he can do on a football field as a wide receiver, that can't go unnoticed. In the case of the Wes Welkers back in the day, the Julian Edelmans right now, the Danny Amendolas of the world, etc., you know, what you look at them as a byproduct of the system and the star quarterback. Again, even though there's Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, there was Jordy Nelson, not to poo-poo Randall Cobb, who can play well himself. But it was clearly Aaron Rodgers, Jordy Nelson. In the case of New England, it's, it's, it's Tom Brady, it's Rob Gronkowski. And I think Rob Gronkowski gets a lot of shine. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that if we're being totally honest, um, a lot of times, you know, wide receivers are emblematic in terms of the lack of shine they may get what CC was alluding to, Skip. It's emblematic of the world that we're living in and exactly what the NFL actually aspires and desires without even admitting it. And that is this. Everything is about the shield and those three letters. You put on your helmet, you put on your shoulder pads, your football equipment, and you go on about your merry way. And when you're celebrated, it's usually the team with the exception of the handful of marquee athletes that the NFL deems marketable mm -hmm. and wants marketable for their brand. What happens is, is that you have a lot of cats in the NFL primarily at the wide receiver position that do other things to bring attention to themselves. The celebrations and the end zones and things of that nature to sort of like, look at me, look at me, look at me. The reason I don't judge it as negatively as some others may judge it is because since the N NFL makes such a concerted effort to be about those letters and about that shield, that brand, at the expense of the individual, and it could potentially cost them money, and we all know their contracts aren't fully guaranteed over the years and years like NBA players, anything that they can do without excessiveness to bring attention to themselves, as long as it's deserved, it, I'm not hating on it. That doesn't usually... Uh, that's not something that's usually required of the white receiver. And that is because if the white receiver is great 
and he wants shine, he's going to get it. Usually when they don't want it, they just don't want it. They don't want to bring attention to themselves. But if they want to bring attention to themselves and they're great at what they do, it will unquestionably come in their direction, mm. more so than with some of these black players. And I think that's why that, that contributes uh, to it to some degree. Okay, so bottom line, I'm going to ask you this question. As a black man, do you find that you occasionally discount the ability of a white wide receiver because he's white? No, Not I don't. Because, okay. I see, because I see what I see. Okay. I see what I see. Now, <clears throat> Rob Gronkowski's great. Yeah, but we're talking about a wide receiver where you have to. That's the, 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 different with the tight ends because there are a lot of white. Well, again, tight ends again, I don't, I don't discount them because of the color of their skin. I okay. discount them because of their absence of ability okay. compared to the black counterparts that they're going up against. If I mean, if you ain't T.O., you ain't T.O. If you ain't Jerry Rice, you ain't Jerry Rice. In today's day, if you ain't Antonio Brown, if you ain't Des okay. Bryant, right, if you ain't Julio enough. Jones, I mean, I don't, I don't see color in that regard. No, I don't. Okay. I think I have been guilty on occasion of discounting the white wide receiver just because the numbers don't lie. I think we're all conditioned a little bit just by the statistics to say, gee, there just aren't very many of them. I'm going to point out to you the last white wide receiver, wide receiver, not tight end, but split receiver to go into the Hall of Fame with Steve Large at 1995. That's 20 years ago. Right. And just to refresh some of our younger viewers' memories, if you keep going back to Hall of Fame inductees. You got Fred Bolitnikoff, you remember yep. from the Raiders. That's all the way back to '88. Don Maynard was was a Joe Namath receiver, but he didn't get in until '87. Right. Lance Allworth, Raymond Barry. You know, you, you can keep going back. All of Crazy them. Legs Hurst, yes. but there aren't that many of these. And then if we look at the Pro Bowl, Jordy Nelson made a Pro Bowl last year mm -hmm. with Aaron Rodgers. Then we go back two years to Wes Welker, who made five for Tom Brady. Right. To me, I always viewed Wes Welker as more of a Brady product, mm -hmm. more of a Brady product than Julian Edelman. Edelman's a freak to me, and I've told you this on the show many times. He is legit. He's not just a slot receiver. That's the only place where I disagree with Chris. You can split Edelman out. He can run 4-5 in the 40. He can get behind people. Got it. He, he has rare quickness and reasonable NFL wide receiver speed, like like a pretty good wide receiver. Four right. or five is, right. is no laughing matter, okay? Mm -hmm. So to me, he's not a Brady product nearly as much as Welker, who ran a four seven forty when he was coming in, okay? Un undrafted. Okay, Element again, a college quarterback draft in the seventh round. Got it. But now back to Jordy Nelson. I've made the point to you several times on the show. I think we're missing the boat here. Jordy Nelson is a freak athlete to Absolutely. me. He's 6'3", 217, and he runs 4'5". Right. I think he helped, I'm not going to say he made Aaron Rodgers, but I think he was a big component that Aaron Rodgers is missing more than some people are giving it credit for. And I've said to you, sort of half-kiddingly, are you sure it wasn't Jordy helping make Aaron Rodgers than vice versa? Because I do think Aaron Rodgers came to rely upon the deep speed that Jordy Nelson has. He's got a gear of speed that makes him, with the football in his hands or, or running under a football, he looks like he runs 4-4 when he's on the football field and pads to me. Mm -hmm. So, so again, there haven't been very many. There aren't very many wide receivers right now. They're mostly slots, like Cole Beasley, uh, Amendola, of course, is going to replace Edelman. But Eric Decker and Jordy Nelson are stud white wide receivers who are stud athletes. You remember, well, Eric Decker is 6'3", 214, and right. runs 4'5". I think Eric Decker is good. I don't consider he's him not a stud. No, he's not. I don't consider him but, a but stud. But he, he is I consider very Jordy athletic. I, yes, yeah. I consider Jordy Nelson a stud. And like you said, the the the, the, the simple numbers... Yeah. You know, say it all because, again, why are you noticing something that's not there? If they're not playing at that position and most of the people who play the position happens to be black, well, that's why the black players would get to shine and the white players would not. It's not like there's a bunch of all-pro wide receivers who happen to be white in the NFL and they're flying under the radar and nobody notices them. They're not there. And I think that's the different equation. When Chris Carter says what he says, then it implies, to some degree anyway, that they're there, but we're not noticing them. Yeah. And what I'm saying is they're not there. If they're there, we're noticing them. That's Look fair. Look at what color you are. If Jordy yeah. Nelson can ball, you're going to notice that. I do think that a lot of the black players, you know, not a lot of them, but the few, you know, bring attention to themselves in a different way. Okay. Antonio Brown with his flips. He's great. 
He's a great player, but you also know in the dancing and all of that stuff, it is what it is. You know, but, hey, when, but, he, uh, when he did the, the, the complete somersault flip, like but, 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 like but to me, I'm like, wow. Well, yeah, but he doesn't yeah, even but need to do that. He doesn't need that because I don't so want him to ridiculous. twist the ankle, hurt okay. an yeah. Achilles. Or that. Enough. Kid, he wants his money. He deserves his money. I want to make sure he gets right. his money. That's my position. You know, Des Bryant with the Exxon or whatever the case may be. Julio Jones doesn't have to do much. Des Bryant doesn't even have to do much. But that X does add to Des's appeal. It does. There's no doubt about that you know you got guys who happen to be white men who may not elect to go that route except but, for one who julian edelman well no question biggest trash talker in pro absolutely, football absolutely. he's in every db's yes. face after every little catch but, but, you'll catch but, but a three yard at the patriots but, parade but, oh, but the flip goodness. side to it y'all, <laughs> i did not see that but the flip side to it guys is this we talk ad nauseum and rave ad nauseum about the greatness of tom brady to the point where we say the bill belichick success era is all about Tom Brady. Tom Brady made Bill Belichick because Bill Belichick wasn't this or wasn't that until Tom Brady arrived. Well, we can't sit there and say that about Tom Brady with Bill Belichick, but they'll say that about Julian Edelman. So it's in, in the case of a Julian Edelman, one could argue that Tom Brady contributes to the lack of respect mm -hmm. that he gets unintentionally, of course, because Tom Brady is just so phenomenal at what he does that you gloss over. It's just like I was watching NFL films and they would you know rehashing the Super Bowl last night on the NFL network and what have you and you had the offensive line coach talking about you know even when they were down 10 he said well we concerned no we weren't because we got Tom Brady the ninja you can do anything you see so when you have that kind of mentality it does not matter who you put out there because he's so great even though Aaron Rodgers is so great Jordy Nelson is such a freak that you can't freak. that you can't disguise right. or hide what he does but what Jordy Nelson usually what Jordy Nelson possesses is usually something that's possessed by a lot of black players which is why you see the vast majority of them at that position over the last 20 years okay so has has Jordy Nelson done himself a disservice by not being more vocal more outspoken more audacious on well, the field well that that his... depend, that depends on what he wants. If he wants more shine, mm. then he has done himself a disservice. If he wants to fly under the radar marketing dollars, and doesn't want that and doesn't want that attention, then he hasn't. But let's also keep in mind that we don't need to use this as an excuse to and I'm not saying we're doing it, but we don't need to use it as an excuse to denigrate players out there who do bring attention to themselves. Because you gotta remember that this is not the NBA. You're not walking around and you're recognizable. That's true. Okay, you're putting on you helmets helmet. and football equipment. I agree. And your identity is disguised yep. to some degree. Different if you don't NBA. step out, if mm -hmm. you don't step out yep. there, you know, then guess what? Nobody knows you all. We, you know, me doing NFL countdown on Sunday mornings. It's, it's NFL players that roll up in their halftime. I don't know who the hell they are until they tell me. You know, see, ain't an NBA player that can walk in there that I won't know because I see them. You don't always see those football players. And there's less of them, too. So they feel compelled to market themselves because they know they're working in a league that doesn't market them. And, and the final thing about any wide receiver, the diva receivers as we call them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can't demand the football. It has to be thrown to them. It, right. It's not. It, it's rare sometimes that they even get a ball That's thrown right. in their direction mm -hmm. if they're double covered. So it drives them crazy. So when they do make a big catch, it's a big they deal. want the world to know about. But in all that That's work, really in the off season, yeah. all that mm -hmm. work, and you're playing in front of empty in, in yep. from the empty stands, and then all of a sudden you get in front of tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. and you perform, you are going to be yep. hyped about that. Yeah. Especially when you have no control from no that. No control. Standpoint. What's better than all punk and everything? Everything you need on GoPhone from AT&T. It gives you unlimited talk, text, and data usage with the first 1.5 gigabytes at high speed. Plus, it's only 40 bucks a month after a $5 auto refill discount. AT&T, mobilizing your world. First payment is $45. $5 discount applied to monthly rate plan charge upon enrollment and auto refill. After first 1.5 gigabytes, get data speeds up to 128 kilobytes per second. Additional charges and restrictions apply. See store for details. Meanwhile, in the NFL, is Peyton Manning done in Denver? ESPN.com insider Mike Sandoz spoke to an NFL personnel director two months ago who said he thought the Broncos would be eager to make the move to Brock Osweiler at the earliest opportunity. The personnel director added, quote, if anybody is going to make the change like that, the person who's going to do it is Elway. No one else could do that in the middle of the season with possibly the greatest quarterback of all time. If stuff does not perk up, there will be a mystery injury. 
and there will be no coming back. Skip, have we seen the last of Manning as a Bronco? I don't know, Stephen A. I, I read this piece, and I was dumbfounded by paragraph after paragraph. And Mike Sando quoted some other insiders, personnel-type people in the NFL, who shared a similar view that the Broncos could not wait to replace Peyton Manning. And at the first opportunity, once they, they demoted him, he would stay demoted. The reason this is hard for me is because Peyton Manning still had this team at 7-1 and one going into the Kansas City, what well, turned into a debacle. And they were down 22 to nothing when Brock Osweiler took over. And he, I, I didn't watch it, but he, the, the numbers are decent, 14-24 for 141 yards, a touchdown and one interception. But that was straight mop-up. That was game lost. You get to go in with not that much expectation and just let it fly. And if, if you're telling me that it's strictly about Peyton's inability to stay healthy, I would get that. If we're talking about just straight ability, I do not get it because I still think Peyton Manning is a much better option than Brock Osweiler. I will tell you, I probably watched Brock Osweiler three times when he was at Arizona State. I watched him once. I wasn't exactly blown away any of the times I watched him. 6'7", 240 pounds, got drafted when he was only 21 years of age, but then again, a second round pick, but, but still, is, is that the next Peyton Manning? Really, that's going to be a better option even right now than Peyton Manning? We know he is, his body is betraying him. We talked on Monday, now he's got a torn plantar fascia mm -hmm. on top of bruised ribs, I don't know if they're cracked, but bruised, and some shoulder issue that they list on the injury report. So he, his body is breaking down. If you're telling me he just can no longer stay healthy at age 39, he'll turn 40 shortly after the season in March. And remember, most quarterbacks, history will show you, hit the wall at 38. That's always been the cutoff age where they start to unravel at 38, even the great ones. Mm -hmm. You can just track it. Mm -hmm. But at 39 going on 40, right. is, is, he just, is the body just shot where he can never stay or get healthy? Okay, if you're telling me that, that's fine. But I'd still rather have Peyton Manning even right now. If he could get healthy in two more weeks to make a playoff run over Brock Osweiler, okay. maybe, maybe I'm missing something here, but I don't get that. And I don't get th – this piece came off – and again, Mike's just quoting these people, but it came off as very harsh, but they seem to know what they were talking about, that it sounds like, and we know that there's been a, a sort of a culture clash between mm -hmm. Kubiak and Peyton, mm -hmm. but it, it almost sounds like when Kubiak took over – his mandate was, we've got to find our first opening to ease Peyton out the back door and go with Brock Osweiler. There's a couple of layers to this that I think you haven't touched on, so I'm going to try to do it for you. First of all, let me be the first to say that Kubiak is the luckiest dude in America. He did absolutely nothing to deserve this job in this pristine position. You have this job. This is nepotism at its best because you have this job because you are a friend and somebody that John Elway knew. I'm not trying to disrespect him. I'm just stating fact. Based on how things ended for you in Houston, yep. based on what you failed to accomplish throughout your years in mm -hmm. Houston, you did not deserve this head coaching job. It's that simple. You're locked up. That's number one. Number two, having said all of that, this is the end for Peyton Manning. I believe that Peyton Manning will retire. I think this is it for him. This so is his we, last he season. will not play another down. I, I, I'm not saying that. I think ultimately I don't have enough faith in Osweiler to be able to deliver the goods this season in terms of a Super Bowl championship. <laughs> that I a lot to ask. Absolutely. That's yeah. a lot to ask yeah. for a guy we haven't seen since yeah. Arizona State. Yeah. Okay. So I'm of the mindset that once Peyton Manning is healthy enough and he can come back, you got to ride the wave with an individual who will go down as one of the greatest quarterbacks who have ever played in the NFL, mm -hmm. you're going to have to ride that wave, all right? So we recognize that. I think we will see Peyton Manning again, but I think that when he comes back for this season, this season will be his last. It will be his swan song. Peyton Manning will announce his retirement at the end of this season, in my opinion. Now, we get to the layers that I think mm -hmm. that you've missed. I think what you, where you're missing the boat, Skip, is that when it comes to John Elway, only John Elway could pull this off because I think he's established himself as an elite executive in this game. I think he's done an outstanding job. Every move hasn't been perfect. But the one thing that you cannot argue about him, 
when he says he's going for a ring, everything that he has done has said to me, I'm going for the ring. Okay. Acquiring Peyton Manning, acquiring DeMarcus Ware, acquiring the team to leave and paying the money they paid. TJ Ward, okay? Yeah, you got rid of John Fox and the staff, but you're bringing Kubiak for the offense. But Wade Phillips is your defensive coordinator, okay? Mm -hmm. Which we know he's elite at doing, all right? Yep. I mean, CJ Anderson and Ronnie Hillman, that ain't Super Bowl caliber stuff, but maybe they'll get their act together and remember to show up and do what we both know they're capable of doing, because we had CJ Anderson on this show. That boy can play you just need to play better I don't know what the hell's going on with their running game having said all of that the layer that we haven't touched skip did it ever occur to you that when it comes even though Elway is within his right because he's a two-time Super Bowl champion who played that position certainly Kubiak doesn't have the right to do it but did it ever occur to anybody that you could actually be tired of Peyton Manning I know that's hard to believe. It's sacrilegious. Are you talking but about John Elway? I'm talking about Kubiak, and to a lesser uh, degree, John I, Elway. I think it's pretty clear me, that what, Kubiak what, was what, tired before he even what, got what, the what, job. Well, let me tell you why I feel that way. Again, Manning is class personified. He's not only great, he's class personified, and the Manning family is the first family. Did it ever occur to anybody that that's kind of annoying for people working with Manning that have their own vision about what they want to do? They don't want you calling this play. They don't want you running this offense. They don't want you to do this okay, and fine. this and that. I'm just saying. But they, Gary Kubiak proved what in Houston? Nothing. Like, thank nothing. You. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not blaming okay. Peyton Manning. All right. All right. You know, I'm saying to you that we keep talking about stuff as it pertains to his injuries, his health, mm -hmm. his body feeling him. Well, that's a given. If you ain't healthy, who can't tell him to sit down? What's the trepidation for? What's all the hesitancy? What's all the anonymous quotes about? That ain't about a dude who's injured. If you injured, but you're great, you're injured. Okay, we'll see you when you get back. It's that simple. There's more here than that. And I believe there's more here than that because the greatness of Peyton Manning sort of dilutes and minimizes and diminishes the importance of other people around him who want to be important. And as a result, that's why you're hearing all of this mimicking stuff and, and all of this stuff going on. Because they don't hate Peyton Manning or anything. He's not a bad guy. Of course not. What they're saying is, is that we have our own vision about what we want to do about life without Peyton Manning. And with this defense playing the way that it's playing, it's even more urgent that we expedite that process. And I think you see a little bit of that going on right now, which is why guys, the anonymous quotes, mm -hmm. the stories and all of that stuff. I also think some of stuff. the hesitancy, though, is because they're not sure if they should be turning to Brock. Well, I don't, I don't agree with that. Here's why. Because he's not healthy. So that's your backup. Now, if he were healthy and then you got a decision to make, you know, weeks from now, your point might be valid. But I think right now you have no choice because we're looking at Wade Peyton Manning and the body's failing. And we're wondering, you know, the plantar fascia and, you know, everything that he's going through. And it's 39 and attrition. All of that stuff is kicked in. So it's a perfect legitimate excuse to sit there and say, Oswala, come on in and show us what you got. And weeks from now, that may not be the case. When Peyton Manning gets healthy, there ain't nothing to discuss. Well, that's why I move out the way Peyton Manning come back. Really? Well, that's, that's not what this story yeah. suggests. And, and I'm telling you, that's why. What other excuse can they possibly have? We've seen nothing from Oswaller. For anybody to sit up there and say, it's time for Peyton Manning to sit down, this guy is going to be our guy. They can't get away with that. Maybe they're and seeing it in practice. They, they might. Well, they, they, maybe well, Gary Kubiak is. All right, maybe so. Maybe so. But you know something? Go ahead and pull that off. This ain't yeah, Drew Brett. Good luck with no, that. This ain't Drew Bledsoe, Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. Tom Brady succeeded. I agree. Yeah, Drew Bledsoe. This is Peyton Manning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't pull that off. But if you were trying to, what other methodology would you exercise other than what we're seeing? Okay. Here's where I do disagree with you. Your bottom line. You think we've seen the end of Peyton like this, he will retire after, after this, this season. season? Yes. Okay. If by chance... Peyton cannot get healthy the rest of this season, and there's a good chance of that. If you if you have torn plantar fascia, you, you, you're not going to be able to come back. You're, you're going to be limpy the rest of the year. So if that's the case, and Peyton just can't get healthy for the rest of the, for the home stretch here, I believe he will definitely want to play one more season. Now, would John Elway say not here? He might. But, but see, that's where it also gets tricky. Because if we look at these reports, and we have no reason to believe with Sando that there's no legitimacy to mm -hmm. it, okay? Well, in a roundabout, tepid way,
if not more directly, you got cats saying we don't necessarily want them. And I find Peyton Manning to be the kind of personality that's like, all right, bye. I don't want to be where I'm not wanted. I've okay, been around but, this game for too but, long. But Peyton, what you gonna do? Go? What you gonna do? Go back to Indy? They ain't an option. Okay. Go to another team? Well, that's a what new I'm saying. system? With Peyton, I don't know about that. Just out of spite, you know, no, like personal spite, I, no, but no. like in a good way. Just he's, say, he's, I want to play another he's, year. He's a grown man. He's a grown man, and and I think that Peyton Manning has accomplished entirely too much in his career to go through that. You know what? If you're not going to be at Denver, I think it's too late in the game in his career to go someplace else and, and say, well, let me start anew for one more year. I don't see that. I could be wrong, Skip, Jets? but I don't see that. With the Jets? I would love it. Hey, he I would love certainly it. start hey. anew on healthy. television. If he, were healthy, if he were healthy, I would love it. But the point is that that's a lot to ask of him at 39 years of age with his body clearly feeling. If the, the one thing he can't dispute that his body is kind of failing him. It is failing. Daddy can't argue. Yeah, I agree. I just checked as this was happening, as the Cowboys were approaching this moment with Manziel being available with the 16th pick, and I asked, uh, would Jerry Jones avoid picking Johnny Manziel? And people suddenly there were saying, I don't think so. With the 16th pick in the 2014 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys select... Zach Martin, guard, Notre Dame. Johnny Manziel still awaits. So, yesterday during a meeting, the three of us were having a little discussion about Johnny Manziel being named the starter of the Browns for the remainder of the season. Skip brought up the bright idea that if Johnny was drafted by Dallas and starting with Romo Hurt, that his squad would be in way better position. Mm. Long story short, Stephen A. jumped all over him mm. and said, save it for 10 o'clock. I laughed. Wait, wait, well, did, I, did you derisively I, state bright idea? Was that sarcastically stated? Well, that was sarcastic because yes. like, I, I think it's wanna, ridiculous. I just, oh, wanna, and I, I just can't believe ridiculous. you believe I want to let the audience know because unlike some people I know, I do not lie to the American public. I Molly want, does. I wanted, to, I wanted to bring up this subject because I wanted you to state on national yeah, TV crazy. what you told me yesterday afternoon about Johnny Manziel. The floor is yours. Yeah, I want go. you to say exactly what Let's you told me. To, to speak the truth of no, no, this no, no, matter? No, 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 no. Just say exactly what yeah. you told me. I'll, I'll state it. I, I might even embellish it a little bit because huh. I've had more time to think about it. I've been thinking about it for about five straight weeks, and last night I thought harder about it mm. to the point point that for sure if Johnny Manziel had been a Dallas Cowboy this year after Tony Romo got hurt he was the backup quarterback I believe Johnny Manziel would have won four of the games that they lost four out of the seven and I might even make a case he would have won five out of seven I'll tell you that oh, in just a moment Lord. here but four would have gotten them to six and three with Romo returning this week and they would effectively be running away with the stop NFC it. East not wow. stop it I can't not wow. stop it Jerry Jones badly wanted to draft Johnny Manziel yes I wanted Jerry Jones to draft Johnny Manziel with the 16th pick but I had no idea he would even be around at 16 and I was stupefied when he fell all the way to 16 and then continued to fall all the way to 22. Somehow, some way, Stephen Jones, his son, or maybe the football people in combination with beautiful, Stephen, beautiful at the last second, Stephen is a great first name, yeah. talked Jerry off his position, we have to draft Johnny Manziel. They went with the highest ranked player on their board who is Zach Martin and boy you cannot fault that pick because no. Zach Martin as a rookie made the Pro Bowl I don't know maybe he's on a Hall of Fame path Zach Martin I still say I would have taken Johnny Manziel we know about all the off-field issues that have ensued we know about the rehab we know about this incident after that incident after this in incident you can make the case to me that Johnny as a native Texan in Dallas could have been in Sin City versus in Cleveland where you say there's not that much to, to do to get in trouble I say Johnny would get in trouble wherever he was if he was so inclined but I also think that Johnny as a Dallas Cowboy was meant to be he was born to be a Dallas Cowboy Johnny oh. is flat out Hollywood oh, Johnny God. is not Cleveland oh, he is God. not a Cleveland Brown I agree with that Johnny Johnny's been stuck with the worst group of skilled players in the National Football League starting for the Cleveland Browns you put him with Dez and you put him with all the other weapons that Dallas has behind that offensive line and say go Johnny go make plays I'm looking down this list and I believe Johnny 
would have won at New Orleans. Remember the overtime game that yep. they lost? I believe he wins that game. They lost 26 to 20 I in disagree. overtime. Okay. I believe he would have beaten Seattle because he would have made one more play than Russell Wilson. He would have out Russell Wilson Russell Wilson. They lost that game 13 to 12. I, I believe he would have beaten the Eagles at Jerry World. They lost that game in overtime 33 to 27 and could not make a play to save their lives with Matt outhouse to castle to outhouse again. And then finally, at Tampa Bay, you don't think Johnny could have made one play no. to win the game at Tampa? Come on. I don't. He, he just would have made it. Oh, yeah, but, but yeah, you're, you're turning it into a Giants topic now. But, but there, I just gave you four. And uh. the first game that they lost was to Atlanta. And again, Brandon just stay off the weed and got them to, to a 28-17 lead at halftime. Could Johnny have done that? I don't know. But Johnny definitely wouldn't have gotten outscored 22 to nothing in the second half against Atlanta, which wasn't yet quite the Falcons, and now we've seen the Falcons come back to earth. Johnny would have won that game, too. I believe that would have gotten them to five more. That would have gotten them to seven and two. And we would have be, be having a very different conversation with Johnny positioned to eventually replace a starting to age Tony Romo. A beautiful thing to watch. So again, he belonged there. He would have saved this year. Jerry should have gotten his way. And Jerry continues to call him a franchise quarterback because even last week, Jerry put Johnny Manziel in the same sentence with Ben Roethlisberger as a franchise quarterback. And all you did by saying that and closing it to that is highlighting that Jerry Jones can be every bit as idiotic as you can ooh, be when it comes to ooh. Johnny Manziel. That is an asinine Am I wrong? Johnny Am I Manziel wrong? in the same sentence. You what Johnny Manziel in the same that's sentence as Big Ben Roethlisberger. And you're gonna, and you're gonna act you're going to act like that's a decent statement to make. You're going to sit there with a straight face. I told you, I thought he was going to be a star. With the camera staring at you. Yes. Are you going to tell me that Johnny yes. Manziel deserved to be mentioned in the same breath did as the Big Browns Ben Browns want Rock Johnny Lisberger? Manziel? I, no, they did not. Answer my nope. question. Johnny Manziel deserves to be as mentioned a, in the same breath as, as a Big Ben Roethlisberger? Sure. You know, what? Okay, deal what? with the issue. Where's the Diet Mountain Dew? I need it checked. Don't Sonny change the subject. I'm not changing the subject. I'm staying on it. you got a lot of nerve fans. That ass is not true. I'm going, I'm going there. You. Number one, they would not have lost to New Orleans. That defensive lapse that happened in the overtime had nothing to do with Johnny Manziel. You'd have lost that game. Oh. You'd have lost to the Eagles. You'd have lost to I the Eagles. That that's right. That's right. Kill the New I'm Orleans I'm defense. Kidding. Kidding. That, that's Johnny right. puts up 30 that's in that game. Please, oh, stop it's it. It's easy. Right. He would have fumbled. Stop he got a strip on. sacked as well. Okay, they would have lost to Philadelphia. All right, they would have lost to the Giants. Oh, by the way. I gave you the by, Giants. By, by, by the way, I think they would have beaten Atlanta. I'll give you credit for that. They would have lost to Seattle. Seattle would have had at least 13 to 12. Don't take them apart. 13 to 12. Don't go by the force fumble. Go by the fact that you saw what Seattle did against Carson Palmer in terms of stripping sack and him twice. I think they would have done that to Johnny Manziel is what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. So I think their defense would have found a way to score because their speed and the pops, they would have hit on him because he's so miniature in NFL standards. Mm -hmm. I think they would have been in a position to take advantage of that, okay? So I'll give you that Johnny Manziel probably could have won two games, two of those games. They would have went two and five with him. Okay, so that would have made them four and five at this juncture. That'd be pretty I give good. You that. That'd be tied for the. I give you that. Lead, I give you right? that. I give you that. Yeah. But to act like they would have gone five and two, five and you know, two. You, that's I, I kind of like that's five just, and two. That's just Russell asinine. Wilson scored thirteen Listen, points. We're at not Dallas. going Are you by that. Me? We're not going by that because we're not just going by what the other teams do. Oh. I'm talking about what a defense would have been able to do to Johnny Manziel. I think that Johnny Manziel against Seattle would have made a couple of turnovers that would have led to scores. Mm. OK, I think the Eagles would have done the same thing because they came into the league and they came into that game. Very opportunistic lead in the NFL in takeaways. I think that Johnny Manziel would have been able to hold on to a 28 to 17 lead or a 21 to 7 lead. Also, mm -hmm. that Atlanta had against mm -hmm. them. Yep. I definitely think that that's something that is plausible. I'll give you that. But I'm not giving them those other games. You need to stop that nonsense. You know what? It's blasphemous. I, I'm also and you're looking. Disrespectful. I just, I just I'm read right over it. You're disrespectful. To Big Ben Roethlisberger. And to Zach Jerry, Martin. And, and, and listen, Zach Martin? What, what, I'm being disrespectful. Yes. I, 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 do you know what he did to that old line? I'm, I'm, okay, wait a second. I, 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 wait a second. Wanna, Hold on just a second. One. I really do. Right. But uh, it's hard for me because the offensive lineman was rated high on the draft board, plus he ended up being an all Okay.
And, and, and here's the point. You think I'm being disrespectful to Zach Martin? I said that, that it was a great pick. Yeah. But Johnny would have been a better pick because they, they already had a Ronald Leary who lost his job to Lyle Collins. Right. They stole Lyle Collins right. in his last draft mm -hmm. because right. he went undrafted because all the issues surrounding him. Mm -hmm. right. So all of a sudden you would have wound up this year with Lyle Collins and Ronald Leary at the guards. Would it be a slight drop off from Zach Martin? A slight one, but I don't think a major well, drop off. Well, I will off. say this to you. Here's the argument that you could make for and against Johnny Menzel being a cowboy. You had just paid Tony Romo his money, and you had promised that you would prioritize the offensive line because that's what he was begging Jerry Jones to do. That's point number one, okay? And But at the same time, it would have been nice to see Johnny Menzel spelling for him. You wanted, you thought Johnny Menzel was a franchise quarterback. Well, how are you going to be a franchise quarterback when you just gave Tony Romo franchise money? He couldn't pull that off. He's 34 years old. But I'm saying, but, but you, but you, you, you want to talk about the you want, Aaron Rodgers. But you want, but yeah, but you want, but that's not what three years. No, you don't, you of all people don't get to say that because you weren't talking. I just did. Allow me to tell you why. You weren't talking about Johnny Manziel waiting. You were talking about Johnny Manziel coming into the NFL immediately and taking the league by storm. I am saying to you, you would have had to wait a minimum of three years with Tony Maybe. Romo. So that doesn't apply. So that, that's why you can justify Jerry Jones passing Doesn't on Doesn't it seem like Tony Romo always gets hurt every year I somehow, agree, I, some way? I agree with that. But we also, okay. but he didn't get hurt last year because the yeah, offensive line, the offensive, he had a yeah, Washington the offensive line was buffered, mm -hmm. okay? And DeMarco Murray was running the football 392 mm -hmm. times. So as a result, the combination of the two, Helped insulate Tony Romo, and as a result, he well, wasn't he had as to play against Washington and he had to start against Arizona. Remember yes, that? yes, okay. yes. Yeah. All right, that's fine. So he, he did but get hurt. He did and get I, hurt. And I'm looking at this Giants game at your Giants oh. this year. Wait, it took a hundred yard kickoff return by Dwayne Harris to win that game 27 to 20. Are we sure? Are we sure Johnny Manziel couldn't have made one Let more play? Let me ask you this question. Last week, Matt Johnny Castle? Manziel. Come Last on. week when Johnny Manziel threw for, completed like 33 receptions, threw for 375 yards against the Pittsburgh Steelers, primarily in garbage time. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, what have we seen from Johnny Manziel? You're getting Over a distorted level. view because he has no weapons oh, well, well, and he has no line. I agree with that. I, and, I, and I agree with that. But what I'm saying to you is you haven't seen it. Now, it's not his fault. It's based on the absence of weapons he has had. But you haven't seen much from Johnny Manziel. All I'm saying is pump the brakes. Don't sit up here and talk like he deserves to be mentioned in the same sentence at any point with Big Ben Roethlisberger. Big Ben Roethlisberger is a future Hall of Famer. I He's one of the great Here's quarterbacks talking about in the NFL. Franchise quarterback. He said, if, if in this next draft, he's saying, if I see a Roethlisberger or a Manziel, maybe I'll take him. But he's not so far seeing a Roethlisberger or a Manziel. So he's saying, I'm not giving in to this. I'm not giving up because I wanted to take Johnny Manziel. Okay. He got talked out of it. Well, he got talked he out of it. He got talked. Well, he can regret it all he wants to, but he doesn't make sense because t Johnny Manziel would not have been used until this year. And oh, by the way, the personnel that you had last year, you might have elected not to get rid of mm -hmm. it. Okay. And then you would still would have been playing Johnny Manziel, but everybody would have been talking about him after you gave Tony Romo $55 million in guarantee. So Jerry Jones is engaging in revisionist history mm -hmm. because he knows that there are suckers everywhere in the United States of America that are going to eat up the headlines because once again we're talking about something in regards to Cowboys who stink. They're two and seven, yes. and Jerry Jones still has them relevant. That's what this is. And here's That's what the Jerry Jones line. is doing. Jerry Jones knows full well Johnny Manziel could have facilitated a Super Bowl run for this Cowboy oh, team. Oh, a Super Bowl run? Yes. Really? Well, That's, so that's where we're going now? Yeah. So we went from Johnny Manziel I riding the him. bench. I hold already on, picked him. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Stop, stop presence. Bring the camera here, please. No, keep oh, it here. Yes. Keep so it we here. go Don't from a few a weeks camera. ago. A few weeks ago, we were wondering whether show. or not it's Johnny Manziel should be playing care. in the I'm league. And, over and him. now I here we are. Not the Johnny Manziel leading act. a team to the Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? Not the solo act. The Super Bowl. You mentioned the Super Bowl. Unbelievable. No, stop it. It's unbelievable. The Super Bowl. It's time to go to commercial, Molly. Let's go. Go ahead to commercial. Go ahead to commercial. Johnny Manziel. No, Super Bowl. no, no, no. That's what you just I, said. No. The Super Bowl. I have okay. something to say. We don't have to worry about backups because guess what? Tony Romo's back and he's uh, going to win the whole bleeping thing. How do you know, do you know he's not going to get hurt Sunday? Stop How do you know he's not going to get hurt Sunday? We don't know Miami. That. that would Fuck just it. make my Let's case see. even stronger. And now for Geico's edition of Stuff Found in Your Car, we go inside your side door pocket. Hello, yes, the crumpled receipt with gum in it. From your anniversary dinner, you sprang for expensive wine, your server was Beth. 
That dinner was a couple hundred dollars. Money you could get back if you switched to Geico and saved hundreds of dollars on your car insurance. I bet you'd save that receipt. Frame it even. But really, where did I go wrong? Was it the corkage fee? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com today. Meanwhile, news out of Houston. Kevin McHale told our Chris Boussard this morning that the Rockets have fired him as head coach. Houston is off to a 4-7 and seven start, good for 11th in the West. The great Magic Johnson tweeting the following after the news broke. If it's true, the Houston Rockets fired Coach McHale. They've made a big mistake. Last season, the Rockets finished second in the West with 56 wins. Stephen A., does Magic have a point here? Yes, he does. Magic Johnson is absolutely right. Uh, Skip, you and I are both fond of Daryl Morey. Uh, he knows what he's doing. Um, I'm certainly not going to try to impugn uh, his decision or what he's done, or actually wh who he is and what he stands for in any way. He is a very good executive in this league who deserves our respect. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anything that I say that I'm about to say to be m misconstrued as me going at him. Okay. But I think it was the wrong decision. First of all, Kevin McHale over the last two seasons has won an average of 66.5% of his games. Mm -hmm. Kevin McHale led the Rockets to, what, the number two seed in the West last year. Mm -hmm. Kevin McHale led them to a Western Conference Finals mm -hmm. appearance, okay? And 11 games into this season, all of a sudden it comes to an end. I think it was entirely premature. Um, I think it was uncalled for. I think that his resume as a head coach, he deserves better than this. But guess what, Skip? I'm not going to put this at the doorsteps of Daryl Morey. And it hurts me to say this. I know where you're going. I'm going to put this at the steps of Dwight Howard. Mm. I'm going to put it right at his doorstep. Please understand what I mean when I say this. I don't want anybody to misconstrue this. This is not Dwight Howard in Orlando where it's a soap opera and all of this stuff's going on and He's a premium. Now, I'm not talking about any of that. I happen to like Dwight Howard. I think he's a good person. Okay? I think he's a much better person than he's given credit for, to be quite honest with you. That's not the issue here about Dwight Howard. You know what the issue is? Your play. Dwight Howard's averaging 15 and 12. Dwight Howard signed an $88 million deal. He turned down a $118 million deal from the Los Angeles Lakers. But he got offered that deal because Dwight Howard, at the time that he arrived in Houston, it was believed that when healthy, is arguably the most dominant big man in the game of basketball. And he has taken a backseat to DeMarcus Cousins. He's taken a backseat to a lesser degree to DeAndre Jordan and other guys in this league who Andre play the Drummond. forward position. Andre Drummond yeah. is now getting more shine. This is a guy that white was, side. this is a guy, White, Hassan White yeah. side of Miami. Mm -hmm. Keep going, skip uh, the hell, Greg Monroe Milwaukee. I okay, I mean, the fact of the matter is when you look at the White Howard, I'm not going to lie to you. Where are you, bro? I, I mean, where is that guy, when healthy, who at least defensively is the most dominant force in the game? I cannot find him. He's averaging about two blocks a game. All right? I get all of that. But when he went to Houston, look, Greg Harden struggling to shoot from the field. Let me say this to y'all. So what? Get over it. Greg Harden will be just fine. He's a superstar. Yeah, James. He just, uh, James Harden. Yeah. I'm saying Greg Harden. James Harden. Yeah. He'll be just fine. Okay, and he's got to adjust to playing with Ty Lawson, who we all know can play. As long as he get his personal issues in order, Ty Lawson can ball. Patrick Beverly has been out for a few games. That's disabled them to some degree. So there's a lot to work with. But Kevin McHale, to me, before Tim Duncan, is the greatest power forward that I ever saw. Kevin McHale knows how to teach power forward spot. That combined with Elijah one was supposed to drastically and positively impact the White Howard. Yet somehow, some way, the White Howard is just another name in the starting lineup of the NBA right now, mm -hmm. and he's better than this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm gonna look into the camera again and say, Dwight Howard, bro, where are you? Where, where, where is that dominant dude that I know can play this game? At least, or, to skip. You gotta remember, Dwight Howard was so dominant defensively that he was able to average 20 because he'd set up fast breaks with block shots. He'd rebound and run the floor. Now, maybe it's injuries because he might not be 100% healthy, but somebody needs to tell Dwight Howard that you were up here when you arrived in Houston. You are now just any other player. And to me, if this dude is on the level that he signed on with Houston to be on, 
Kevin McHale still has his job. Kevin McHale is still a head coach in Houston. If Dwight Howard is that dominant player that we all know him to be, good guy, I don't want to hear any negative stuff about him and his personality, stop it. There's the problem with Dwight Howard. There are other big men in the game who look better than you. Hmm. And that is why, to me, Kevin McHale is gone. So you're saying Dwight's lack of production. Yes. Did yes. Kevin McHale. If, think about it, Skip. If, if Dwight Howard was Dwight Howard in Orlando, even if Dwight Howard, who wasn't 100%, but was in L.A. with them, yep. th Houston doesn't look like this. It, Kevin McHale still has his job. It, this, is, this is what okay. it is. Yeah. Yesterday, you did say to me, uh-oh, yes. Kevin McHale's going to be in trouble. Quickly. I told you yesterday yep. afternoon when we were filming our promos that's going to be running yep. in a few weeks, I told you I didn't think that Kevin McHale was going to make it through the night, mm -hmm. that I'm hearing he could be gone. I, you know, and it happened. Okay, so I got to get to the, the, the guts of this. Sure. Why did it happen? Was it Daryl Morey saying something has to happen here somebody's got to go somebody's got to pay because we're four and seven that's only 11 games into the year would Daryl Morey overreact that quickly no. to this start okay was it a player revolt against Kevin McHale possibly because this is a tough team to coach yes personalities on James that. Harden's he's, he can be a little different he can be his own guy you've had some issues with him before right you never know yeah. so you threw in Ty Lawson, that was Daryl Morey throwing him in, mm -hmm. saying, we need a point guard, we need to put you as the off guard, we need the ball out of your hands completely, you know, where, where we get it into your hands just to shoot the basketball. And maybe James has not liked that flow, that mix, that rhythm with Ty Lawson. Mm -hmm. But is that Kevin McHale's fault? Because I know Kevin a little, not a lot. He is his own man. Yes, he, is. he takes nothing off nobody because he doesn't need to. He was and is a Hall of Fame basketball player, and a lot of our younger viewers don't know what you were just saying, but he was great. They don't realize that. Great. I love the mailman, Ooh. Carl Malone. I love Carl Malone. Mm -hmm. Carl Malone was not a better power forward than Kevin McHale. Right. From 10 feet I, in, I would agree Kevin with McHale was the most yep. dominant okay. offensive power so forward. So he ever. knows that. He knows Other he can teach it. And he knows he took this team to the second seed in the West and all the way to the conference finals. That was, that was a pretty good year. And so now at 4-7, and seven, you're out because of what? i got to believe it was a player revolt where either Harden and or Dwight and or whoever else you want to throw into the mix, Patrick Beverly, I don't know, where they all just said, this is not working with Kevin. He's become diff too difficult for us to, to deal with. And finally, Daryl Morey threw up his hands and said, okay, i got to change the, 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 the scenery here. You know? I'll look into it. I'll know the answer to that question in a few hours from some of my mm -hmm. NBA sources. But let me say this. Number one, I don't want to put that on the players on that level. I don't think that James Harden and those guys are those kind of guys. They might be a bit temperamental, I can't a be. bit sensitive yep. at times. Mm -hmm. You know that with James Harden, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to flow with me, like me, or whatever the case yep. is. I love and respect those guys for who they are and what they represent in the, to the basketball community. They're great guys. They're ambassadors for the game. They bust their tails. They work hard, and they produce for the most part. Just because you got a different personality, it's up to a coach to learn how to ingratiate himself with those different personalities and adjust accordingly and go with that. I don't believe that would be the case this early, not when you're just fresh off a Western Conference Finals appearance. Plus I think the analytics... They're, remember they, their comeback against the Clippers? Yes, the, it was like all the, time, right? All time. 19 oh points God. in the third quarter. I scored a 49-9. and nine. Don't get me started with that. I'm still depressed. The <laughs> point that I'm trying to make to you is that... When you look at it from that perspective, there were analytics guys, because we know that Daryl Morey's into that, and Kevin McHale had to adjust to that usage. Sure. That could have played the role. Maybe. But I think the one undeniable component, because I'm not trying to say, when I say Dwight Howard, I'm not trying to say that was the only reason. Mm -hmm. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to say he did it intentionally. I'm just saying that Dwight Howard's got to play better. You're big time as a player. We just can't see it. You don't look mm -hmm. that way. And I believe that if you remember, I was there. I interviewed... Dwight Howard, mm -hmm. the day he signed with Houston and had his press conference in Houston on that Saturday afternoon, you remember that, Skip, I was there. Guess who else was there? The Calvin Murphys of the world, yeah, the Akeem the Dream, Elijah Wands yeah. were there. I believe it, Moses Malone was there, God rest his soul. You know, uh, uh, Kevin McHale, obviously. Mm -hmm. You had big men there, and he was perceived, he was being ballyhooed as the next great yeah. big man for the Houston Rockets uh, franchise. Oh, I got it. We have not seen that since he has arrived. And somebody needs to tell Dwight Howard, 
it is time because James Harden actually deserves that. He's too much of a superstar okay. for you not okay, to be but, who but you're supposed to be. You know and I know, in the end, this team revolves around James Harden. It did all last year when he put up MVP kind of numbers. His numbers are way off. He's had some really bad right. nights this yes, year. Yes, but okay. Skip, it also helps when you block shots mm -hmm. and you facilitate sure. breaks I and score it. easy baskets. That's what I'm talking about with Dwight Howard. We got to see it, man. He's got to step up. Jordy Nelson is one of the best route runners, very, very explosive, a deep threat, can run any route in the route tree, and is a great um, with the ball in his hands after the catch. Now, Edelman is a tremendous slot receiver, has great short area quickness, has understanding to be able to read the defense, and has great chemistry with Tom Brady. I believe he's just as good as Troy Brown was, but people give credit for Troy Brown for being good. And... I think Wes Welker and Edelman and some other guys, they don't get credit because they're white. So that was our Chris Carter earlier today on Mike and Mike speaking out about the lack of recognition for white NFL receivers. We welcome in Brian Dawkins to the desk. Good to see you. See you as well. All right, Brian. So do you agree with CeCe's comments here? I, I hear what he's saying, and but on this one I have to disagree. Okay. Um, I think that if you look at Wes Welker and Edelman, um, I think that a lot of it, I think Tom Brady takes away from what they do. I think sometimes even goes with Peyton Manning with some of his receivers. Because of what Peyton is, as great as he is, they say that you can just put anybody in those offenses mm -hmm. and they'll have success. I think that when you look at the receiver position, for whatever reason, it's become, well, I do know the reason, but because of the athlete, athlete, the athletes that are at the position, the receivers, the, the, uh, the brothers, mm -hmm. they are able to do things on a consistent basis on the outside mm -hmm. to exploit some of the coverages that goes up against them with mm -hmm. today's rules, the, the way that things are today. I think that if you look at um, Jordy Nelson, I think he is one of the exceptions because he has that athleticism. He can actually get off the line of scrimmage. He can stretch the field. He has the speed. He has the ability to do some of those things. I don't think it, but I, I really don't think it's discrimination. It reminds me of the cornerback position. And I was really trying to think, when was the last time I could remember having a white cornerback? you got to go way back. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, when was the last time? And I don't think it's because of, you know, cornerbacks, white guys, you know, are with prejudice against those guys. Just, you're, I think you're just that, saying the facts. You're just saying the, the facts, athletes, right? the yeah. at, more the athletes are, are, are apt to be um, African Americans in that, at that position. But I don't think that the guys are not getting the credit. I think they're getting the credit. I just don't think it's going to be the credit that the Julio Jones gets, mm -hmm. the Megatron gets, because listen, when you're talking about those guys, you're talking about potential Hall of Fame type of guys. Mm -hmm. So I think that they get the credit, they get that type of, you know, credit. But um, to, to Chris's point, Wes Walker and those guys will not. I don't think they ever will get that type of pub. It's not because of white. I think it's because of talent. Mm. Well, that's basically what I said, and I think that when you look at it from the point of what Chris Carter was saying. I get where he's coming from, but there's a couple of sides to this. Uh, number one is what you're pointing out, the fact that predominantly at those positions, you see black players as opposed to white players. Uh, and then the other point that I brought up to Skip and Molly earlier was the fact that in the case of a Julian Edelman example, who Skip considers a stud, we've raved so much about Tom Brady that pretty much everybody is glossed over because of the greatness of Tom Brady, because you're perceived as being a byproduct of the greatness that he puts on display on a year-to-year -year basis. Whereas, for example, even though Aaron Rodgers is so great, there isn't a sustained system spanning years and years and years in Green Bay for you to look at Tom Brady, uh, Aaron Rodgers and say, it's everybody else with Aaron Rodgers. You right. see what I'm saying? Whereas with Tom Brady, he's been in New England, you know, for better for the, third, the last 13, 14 years doing this with the same coach. You understand? And, and, and pretty much the same system. So you look at it from that perspective, and obviously that factors into the equation as well. And then we can take it to another level. Like, for example, we see Matthew Stafford. But he's throwing the Megatron. Mm -hmm. When Megatron doesn't seem to be Megatron, where does Detroit's offense go? How does it look? And so because of that, and you see that if you're getting shine, I think that the one thing that we have to recognize, black or white, if you're getting shine at a particular offensive position, you sort of take away from some of the other guys who are valid stars in Minnesota. 
I'm quite sure they may have some dudes, whether it be in Rudolph, Bridgewater, or whomever, that, you know, have contributed, obviously, mm -hmm. to them being 7-2. and two. But all we think about AP. is AP, AP Adrian AP. Peterson. Yep. And especially in the NFL, with that shield, helmets on, shoulder pads, equipment, people not having a personal relationship with you from a visual perspective because you're wearing that equipment and this sort of <laughs> hides your identity. Combined <laughs> with, this, with this fixation on promoting the shield and those three letters, all of those things added to the fact that there are particular athletes who get the most shine. Mm -hmm. I think all of those play a role in diminishing the sizzle that the white receivers could potentially okay. get. But all it right. ain't many of them, and that also is a reason why. You know, look, okay. Can I add to that also? When, when, when you go into a game and you're going to prepare for a team, as a defensive coordinator, as a defensive player, we look at receivers and say, okay, who do I have to roll coverage to because of their greatness because of the, what the, how the team either, either uses them. For instance, Randy Moss, all right, when he was in his heyday, there, there's only so many guys I gave that type of respect to, to line up maybe 15 yards deep sure. instead of 10 to 12. It's because of what he can do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, I think because of the talent, you look at things a little different. You see, we've seen things a specific way for so long, and it's been those guys outside, Megatron, those type of guys, that now we're getting more of the long, linear type receivers instead of the mm -hmm. short, quick receivers. Okay. And some of the white guys are sh the short, okay. quick receivers, and they work in the slot better. Let's give mm -hmm. the piggyback off of this point. Remember Barry Sanders running, running back for the Detroit Lions. With other people, you look at guys and, you know, you had this dude, the hitman or somebody like him, playing against Barry Sanders at that time, playing against anybody else. You're trying to cave their chest in. You're trying to smash them. With Barry Sanders, you literally found yourself trying to stand in your lane and saying, okay, let me just make sure I control this gap yes. because he was so elusive. Mm -hmm. He would embarrass you with the jukes that he would put on you. So his talent made you scared to come at him full okay. throttle because he could embarrass you. Okay, that kind so, of ability. So I'm talking. hearing this conclusion that it's not discrimination as you see it. Right. It's simply the, the white receivers don't deserve that much credit because they're not that good. Is that fair? I'm not yes. saying deserve the credit. I'm saying get the type of shine, as he put it, that some of the, the, the black players okay, have. But you're, but because you're saying of, because they yeah, break but they're the just not line. as good, right? Is that is that a conclusion? Well, they're not playing the they're position. Okay. There, there are two freaks to me who are white wide receivers. Jordy Nelson. And I put I put Jordy Nelson yes. in because remember he's six three two seventeen yes. and runs four five. Okay, right. that's. That's big time. Yes. I'm not saying he's Megatron. Mm -hmm. I do think he was having Megatron-like impact for Aaron Rodgers. Got it. I don't think Aaron Rodgers has been nearly as good without Jordy no, Nelson. No, no, okay, that's okay. Right. okay, so it's a big deal. That's, 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 that's a right. lot of credit right. I'm giving Jordy Nelson. I think Julian Edelman is a little freak. He's not as big. Again, about six feet tall, maybe mm -hmm. 200 pounds. But listen, he is 4'5". He has rare quickness and reasonably great speed downfield he can they can split him outside and he can run by people too i'm not saying you roll coverage to him but he can hurt you by running by let people. me ask you this because you actually are better to answer cc's mm -hmm. proclamations than either brian or myself mm -hmm. with the question i'm about to throw at you you talk about julian edelman and how much of a little freak he is. Stephen, I'm sorry to cut you off. Hold that thought and that question. We have to go to break really quickly, okay. but we're going to stay on this subject right. and, and right. come right back okay. to it. Jordy Nelson is one of the best route runners, very, very explosive, a deep threat, can run any route in the route tree, and is a great um, with the ball in his hands after the catch. Now, Edelman is a tremendous slot receiver has great short area quickness, has understanding to be able to read the defense, and has great chemistry with Tom Brady. I believe he's just as good as Troy Brown was, but people give credit for Troy Brown for being good. And I think Wes Welker and Edelman and some other guys, they don't get credit because they're white. So that was our Chris Carter earlier today on Mike and Mike speaking out about the lack of recognition for white NFL receivers. We welcome in Brian Dawkins to the desk. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. All right, Brian. So do you agree with CeCe's comments here? I, I hear what he's saying, and but on this one I have to disagree. Okay. Um, I think that if you look at Wes Welker and Edelman, um, I think that a lot of it, I think Tom Brady takes away from what they do. I think sometimes even goes with Peyton Manning with some of his receivers. 
because of what Peyton is, as great as he is, they say that you can just put anybody in those offenses mm -hmm. and they'll have success. I think that when you look at the receiver position, for whatever reason, it's become, well, I do know the reason, but because of the athlete, athlete the athletes that are at the position, the receivers, the, the, uh, the brothers, mm -hmm. they are able to do things on a consistent basis on the outside mm -hmm. to exploit some of the coverages that goes up against them mm -hmm. with today's rules, the, the way that things are today. I think that if you look at um, Jordy Nelson, I think he is one of the exceptions because he has that athleticism. He can actually get off the line of scrimmage. He can stretch the field. He has the speed. He has the ability to do some of those things. I don't think it, but I, I really don't think it's discrimination. It reminds me of the cornerback position. And I was really trying to think, when was the last time I could remember having a white cornerback? You, you got to go way back. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, when was the last time? And I don't think it's because of, you know, cornerbacks, or white guys, you know, are with prejudice against those guys. Just, you're, I think you're just that, saying the facts. You're saying the, the facts, athletes, right? the, yeah. more of the athletes are, are, are apt to be um, African Americans in that, at that position. But I don't think that the guys are not getting the credit. I think they're getting the credit. I just don't think it's going to be the credit that the Julio Jones gets, mm -hmm. the Megatron gets, because listen, when you're talking about those guys, you're talking about potential Hall of Fame type of guys. Mm -hmm. So I think that they get the credit, they get that type of, you know, credit. But um, to, to Chris's point, Wes Walker and those guys will not, I don't think they ever will get that type of pub. It's not because of white. I think it's because of talent. Mm. Well, that's basically what I said. And I think that when you look at, it from the point of what Chris Carter was saying, I get where he's coming from, but there's a couple of sides to this. Uh, number one is what you're pointing out, the fact that predominantly at those positions, you see black players as opposed to white players. Uh, and then the other point that I brought up to Skip and Molly earlier was the fact that in the case of a Julian Edelman example, who Skip considers a stud, we've raved so much about Tom Brady that pretty much everybody is glossed over because of the greatness of Tom Brady because you're perceived as being a byproduct of the greatness that he puts on display on a year-to-year -year basis. Whereas, for example, even though Aaron Rodgers is so great, there isn't a sustained system spanning years and years and years in Green Bay for you to look at Tom Bra uh, Aaron Rodgers and say it's everybody else with Aaron Rodgers. You right. see what I'm saying? Whereas with Tom Brady, he's been in New England, you know, for better for the thir last 13, 14 years doing this with the same coach. You understand? And, and, and pretty much the same system. So you look at it from that perspective, and obviously that factors into the equation as well. And then we can take it to another level. Like, for example, we see Matthew Stafford. But he's throwing the Megatron. Yes, mm -hmm. When Megatron doesn't seem to be Megatron, where does Detroit's offense go? How does it look? And so because of that, and you see that if you're getting shine, I think that the one thing that we have to recognize, black or white, if you're getting shine at a particular offensive position, you sort of take away from some of the other guys who are valid stars in Minnesota. I'm quite sure they may have some dudes, whether it be in Rudolph, Bridgewater, or whomever, that, you know, have contributed, obviously, mm -hmm. to them being 7-2. and two. But all we think about AP. is AP, AP, Adrian Peterson. Yep. And especially in the NFL, with that shield, helmets on, shoulder pads, equipment, people not having a personal relationship with you from a visual perspective because you're wearing that equipment and this sort of mm. hides your identity. Combined yeah. with, this, with this fixation on promoting the shield and those three letters, all of those things added to the fact that there are particular athletes who get the most shine. Mm. I think all of those play a role in diminishing the sizzle that the white receivers could potentially okay. get, but All it ain't right. many of them, and that also is a reason why. You know, look, okay. can, I, can I add to that also, when, when, when you go into a game and you're going to prepare for a team, as a defensive coordinator, as a defensive player, we look at receivers and say, okay, who do I have to roll coverage to because of their greatness, because of the, what the, how the team either uses them? For instance, Randy Moss, all right? When he was in his heyday, there, there's only so many guys I gave that type of respect to, to line up maybe 15 yards deep sure. instead of 10 to 12. It's because of what he can do. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, again, I, I think because of the talent, you look at things a little different. You see, we've seen things a specific way for so long, and it's been those guys outside, Megatron, those type of guys, that now we're getting more of the long, linear type receivers instead of the short, quick receivers. And some of the white guys are sh the short, quick receivers, and they work in the slot better. Let's get the piggyback off of his point. Remember Barry Sanders running, running back for the Detroit Lions. With other people, you look at guys and, you know, you had this dude, the hitman or somebody like him, playing against Barry Sanders at that time, playing against anybody else. You're trying to cave their chest in. You're trying to smash them. With Barry Sanders, you literally found yourself trying to stand in your lane and saying, okay, let me just make sure I control this gap yes. because he was so elusive, mm -hmm. he would embarrass you with the jukes that he would put on you. So his talent made you scared to come at him full okay. throttle because he could embarrass you. Okay, that kind so, of ability. So I'm talking. hearing this conclusion that it's not discrimination as you see it. Right. It, it's simply the, the white receivers don't deserve that much credit because they're not that good. Is that fair? I'm not That's saying deserve the credit. I'm saying get the type of shine, as he put it, that some of the, the, the black players okay, have. But you're, but because you're saying of, because they yeah, break but they're the just not line. as good, right? Is that is that a conclusion? Well, they're not playing the they're position. Okay. There, there are two freaks to me who are white wide receivers. Jordy Nelson. And I put I put Jordy Nelson yes. in because remember he's six three two seventeen yes. and runs four five. Okay, right. that's. That's big time. Yes. I'm not saying he's Megatron. Mm -hmm. I do think he was having Megatron-like impact for Aaron Rodgers. Got it. I don't think Aaron Rodgers has been nearly as good without Jordy no, Nelson. No, no, yeah, okay, right. okay, so it's a big deal. That's, 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 that's a right. lot of credit right. I'm giving Jordy Nelson. I think Julian Edelman is a little freak. He's not as big. Again, about six feet tall, maybe mm -hmm. 200 pounds. But listen, he is 4'5". He has rare quickness and reasonably great speed downfield he can they can split him outside and he can run by people too i'm not saying you roll coverage to him but he can hurt you by running by let people. me ask you this because you actually are better to answer cc's mm -hmm. proclamations than either brian or myself mm -hmm. with the question i'm about to throw at you you talk about julian edelman and how much of a little freak he is. Stephen, I'm sorry to cut you off. Hold that thought and that question. We have to go to break really quickly, okay. but we're going to stay on this subject right. and, and right. come right back to okay. it. More in just a minute.
Welcome back into First Take. Brian Dawkins is still here with us. And let's pick up where we left off. Stephen A., you had a question for Skip. I had a question because based off of what Chris Carter said, I think more so than Brian Dawkins or myself, Skip, you're the perfect person to answer this question. When you talk about Julian Edelman being that stud, but not being recognized because that's what Chris Carter was alluding to, how responsible does somebody like even yourself feel considering the fact that you rave so much about Tom Brady, knowing that mm -hmm. potentially it could be rationale for how Julian Edelman gets reduced, simply because the greatness of Tom Brady is elevated above all things. But I've told you for years, you have. I thought Welker was more a product of Brady than this kid, right. because this guy, as he's emerged, Edelman, he's, he's his own man right. to me, because he, he will get in anybody's face down the field, he will make noise, he will... He, he is that guy. He is a fire starter. He is helping Brady. He's helping make Brady you, as much as vice versa. You've always made that point, but stay with me on this, Brian, because what I'm asking you is because of how much you rave about Brady, how much of an issue do you think the media, including yourself, plays in the fact that Edelman, there may be validity to Chris Carter's comments because of how much Brady is so elevated? Because when I hear you talk about Edelman, I'm not going to lie to you. Even to me, it's an afterthought because I remember you saying that everybody's a product could, of Brady's could we, greatness. Could we conclude that if Edelman were black, that he would also be being discounted yes, as a yes, product? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. I'm with you well, on that's that. That's what I'm saying. Okay, that's that, what I'm saying. that well could be the case. Yes. The, the only person that will not ever be is, is Randy Moss. In that, That's in a that good system. point. Because of who he is. And again, when we start talking about these individuals, these being Randy Moss type mm -hmm. guys, that's once in a lifetime type of dude. These are not the dudes to come along oh, all the time. Right. And and believe me, when you have GMs and they sit and watch film and they're trying to get personnel, you best believe they're not saying, okay, because this guy's a white guy, I'm not going to on the team. They're not, nobody's accusing they're them not of that. doing that. Yeah, right. On the other side of it, when guys step on the football field, the respect factor, and I'm speaking from a player's perspective, a respect factor for a player in a system goes a long way. It does. But then you just have those special guys that step outside of the system and begin to do things that the system did not I agree. teach it, you know, teach, I'm with teach you. them to do. Yep. This is what I'm talking about when you start talking about some, you know, some of the brothers that have done it for a consistent okay. basis outside. Right. And, that's and I, I think, think Jordy Nelson is second echelon of what you're talking about. Yes. He's not in the top. He's not in that Randy Moss, Megatron, Julio, wh whoever you want to throw up in the Des Bryant. He's not there, but he's second echelon as an impact wide receiver. And the only other starting wide receiver I know, and I brought him up, is Eric Decker. They're about the same size and same speed, but Eric Decker obviously is not Jordy Nelson. And then we, we, if we just look at the numbers, there are about four other slot receivers who are white, right? You've got Edelman, Amendola now, mm -hmm. obviously replacing Edelman. Mm -hmm. You've got Cole Beasley in Dallas, and, and you've got what's left of Wes Welker now playing for the Rams. And after that, I, I don't know anymore. So the facts are the facts. It's just, there, there just aren't very many. Yeah, they're not, but again, I guess back to Chris's point, are they getting the credit Okay. Well, being and I'm and I, I I think that they are I think that the guys that do it yeah. do it well get credit. I think they do, but I think that the ones who don't that may deserve it is because of the greatness of a teammate mm -hmm. that has such a profound impact that you can't help but gloss over it because Patriots are about next man up. Mm -hmm. Even no matter who goes down because we got the ninja, we got Tom Brady, yep. Yep. enough said. And when that happens, that is what Brady contributes. Mm -hmm. to, uh, that, 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 you know, that's the shadow over those guys. That's what right. I think. Yeah. Porzingis is one-on-one. -on -one. He spins, he dunks. Wow. Three-pointer by Porzingis. Good. Oh, baby. A jump shot by Carmelo is short. And Porzingis, above everybody, dunks it home. Galloway for three. No, not that time. And Porzingis stuffs it home. He straightened the ceiling. Wow. Down low to Porzingis. He puts him off shot and hits. This crowd is roaring. Stops for Zingas has another big night for the Knicks. 29 points and 11 boards and a win over the Hornets. Stephen A., what is your reaction to yeah, all this thing love in your city? I got to admit, I'm stunned. He deserves it. I like the promise. Phil Jackson looks like he did well with mm -hmm. this pick. I'm actually going to go to the Knicks game. I'm going to end my Are you? Yeah. Go. Huh. I'm going to go in a few days. I'm going to go to the really? Knicks. I called them yesterday to let them know I was coming. Uh -oh. And I will say this to you, though. 
My position on Phil Jackson is still one right for trepidation. You don't get paid 10 to $12 million just to finish last, stink during a regular season, and capture a high draft pick. As an executive, with his cachet, his name recognition, you have to show me you can go out there and recruit a marquee free agent. Right. Otherwise, you ain't no different than Sam Hinkie in Philadelphia who couldn't recruit anybody out of a paper bag. He's just trying to build okay. off of the draft. So are you willing to admit that the future is suddenly now for your Knicks thanks to a 20-year-old I wouldn't say the future is now. What I would tell you is that I like Porzingis a lot. 29 and 11? Well, that's against Charlotte. But Did I, you see I, the I like green shake? I like you him see a lot. the put-back dunk? I saw it. See the I easy it, threes? I saw it. It's a little bit awkward. Got to put some weight on his bones. We'll awkward. see what happens. Do you, you realize he's putting pressure on Melo to live yes. up to Porzingis? Yes, he is. And I like Whoa. that. I like that. Oh. I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing for the New York Knicks. I want to state for the record, you should go and support the Knicks. My boycott is Do over. One thing for me, support please him. take a selfie with Porzingis. Please, Maybe. please Maybe. send us that. Appreciate you listening to us. Catch First Take weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern and catch the rear at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The season ended today. The Falcons and Colts would be in the postseason, but both have lost three of their last four and are desperate for a win. The Falcons and Colts coverage begins Sunday at noon Eastern on ESPN Radio.